Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 13, verses 7 to 9, which is our text today. It's on page 792 in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along there, if you don't have your own copy of the Word of God, we have one there in the pew nearby. If not, somebody nearby will be able to share with you. Uh, today, we're also going to have the scripture on the screen. Uh, we're just dealing with three verses, and so we want to talk about that and how it relates to this question. Have you ever needed to be saved from yourself? Oh, I see, I see some murmur of, oh yeah, yeah, that had that happen. Sometimes in our life we need to be saved from ourselves. We are our own worst enemy. In the words of Pogo, we have met the enemy, and it is us. And sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Couple that with what we've just been singing about, that you can't be saved by your own efforts. You can't be rescued by your own efforts. There's a lot of things we can do to improve our lives temporarily. There's a lot of things we can do to change our thinking, to change our behavior, to make sure we're doing the things that we ought to be doing. But ultimately, all of that will fail. And ultimately, all of that is absolutely useless in restoring us into a relationship with God, our Father. When people reject a life centered on God, there are two options. In our text today, destruction or purification. Destruction or purification. And I would suggest that the scripture is telling us today that we're utterly dependent upon God for purification. We're looking at the very last part of the book of Zechariah, as we talked about. The first part is about the, the visions, the first uh, chapters, first six chapters, there's eight visions. And he calls them to repent, to turn, to change their life to make sure that they are following God, to stop focusing so much upon what they had been focusing on, which is, how are we going to get food for today? How are we going to try to make a living? Because it was tough back in the land. Economically, things were not working. Agriculturally, they were in difficult straits. Uh, it was really hard just to grow enough food, much less to have people to trade with. There were so few people there that had returned. And so it was very difficult, so much so that with just a little bit of opposition, well, let me not minimize it, with a great deal of opposition, they had quit building the temple. They had said, well, we're going to have to put off worshiping God until we've got things worked out in our life, until we're sure that we've got enough money, we've got enough income, we've got enough things going on that we can make it. Do you see how backwards that is? It's what, what you're saying when you say that, when they were saying that, what, if we say it, it's this thing, it's all dependent on me. God can maybe help me some, but if I get things worked out, then I'll come to God. A lot of times people are that way about salvation. Once I get my life straightened out, I've got everything worked out, then I'll seek the Lord. Not a good policy. You really do need the Lord to straighten your life out. You really do need the blessing of the Lord to make things work out in your life. Without that, it's not going to work out. You're heading for destruction rather than for purification. He says you need to turn back to the Lord. And we saw those eight visions. Then the next part of this, he talks about uh, in, in the four messages where they really were going through the motions of mourning for the Lord. Remember, the, they said, do we still have to fast and mourn as we've been doing for these all these many years? And he says the time for that is over. You rebuild the temple and I will begin to bless you and that times of mourning will be over. But do not think that this cannot happen again. Just because things are working out and you've got this straightened out, if you turn back to the ways of your fathers and go back to idols, if you just make a veneer of worship on the outside, but on the inside you're worshiping something else besides me, you're relying on something else besides me, don't think that I will not bring this judgment upon you again. And then now in the last half of the book, 9 to 14, or the last third of the book, we have two messages, and we've talked a little bit about that. But I want us to look in particular in chapter 13 at verses 7 through 9. And we're going to read these this morning. I'll read them to you, and then we'll pray, and then we'll talk about what these mean. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 to 9. You should be there. Listen along as I read. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd. And the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn against the lambs. Two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord. But one-third 
will be left in the land. I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Let's pray. Father, we come to your word, seeking, Lord, of course, to know what Zechariah was saying to those people, to understand how you worked with your people in the past. But Lord, in particular, we're really seeking to know how we ought to live today. Father, we know that all the scriptures are given for our edification, for our admonition, that we might learn how to live in these last days. But Father, we truly believe we're in the end of the ages. And Lord, that one day you're going to return and receive us to yourself, that the day of the Lord will come. And Father, the judgment that comes with it. Father, not only are we preparing for that day, but Lord, we are preparing for this day and the next, that we might live in faith in you. So I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit will so teach us, so open our hearts and minds, that we might begin to grasp the great truths of your Scripture and how they apply to us today. Lord, we humbly beseech this, because we know only you can do that. And Lord, we desperately need it. In Christ's name we pray this. Amen. First part of 13.7 says, we're going to strike the shepherd. Wake, O sword, and strike the shepherd. Raises the question, what's wrong with the shepherd? Wouldn't you wonder that? If God's going to kill him, there must be something wrong with the shepherd. If God is going to slay the shepherd, there must be something wrong with the shepherd. There are only two commands in, the, in this whole passage. The first one is to the sword. It says, awake, O sword. And just saying it that way sounds pretty ominous, doesn't it? Awake, O sword. And then the next command we find is strike down the shepherd. Strike down the shepherd. Now some people would say there obviously is something wrong with the shepherd. Many of the commentaries that I read talk about what's wrong with the shepherd. That God is destroying the shepherd because he's become wicked like the false prophets and like the priests of the lands that he'd been talking about in chapter 13 in the previous part. I would suggest to you, and this is just me suggesting it to you, I would suggest to you that that is eisegesis, not exegesis. That they are reading into these verses what I don't think is there. Look what he says. Awake, O shepherd, against my, uh, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner. Does that sound like an enemy? Now, I can show you plenty of commentaries that are on your side if you think he's, there's something wrong with the shepherd. But I'm telling you, I think they're wrong. That's just me speaking. You look at the text and see what it has to say about that. But it sounds to me like the shepherd and God are together. That the shepherd is serving God and that God is striking down the shepherd. The passage as it goes on, as we read through, doesn't talk anything else bad about the shepherd, but it does say... The sheep need to be judged, and some of them God is going to refine. I would suggest to you the problem is not the shepherd. The problem is the sheep. Who are the sheep? Well, they're the people of the land. They are the Israelites. In fact, in Zechariah's day, it's the ones who have come back to the land. You see, it's not enough to build a tabernacle if it doesn't change your heart. God says, I want you to understand you need to change. There needs to be a purification going on. Now, you say, how do you know, other than just because you think so, that this is the right interpretation of verse 7, that he's saying, I'm going to strike the shepherd so I can get at the sheep. That's what I'm saying it says. Let me suggest two things. One, whenever you're seeking to know whether you have the right interpretation of a passage, you ask yourself this question, is that what the text says? You see, one of the things we're trying to learn how to do is to study the Bible for ourselves. The Word of God is the authority, not the commentaries, not pastors, not theologians, not church authorities, but it's what does the Bible actually say for itself. You have to be very careful not to read into the Scriptures what you want to find there. Now, why do I say you have to be careful with that? Because in my experience, we all want to do that. We all bring so much to the text that we want to read into it what's there rather than saying, well, what does it actually say? Does it actually say there's something wrong with the shepherd? No, other than the fact that he's killed, it doesn't say there's anything wrong with the shepherd. 
So I would suggest that's an idea that's been introduced to the text. Now there's a second question that you may not be familiar with that I think you need to ask in this context. And that is, would they recognize your interpretation? When you've come up with, here's what I've read in the text, and here's what I think it means, now you ask yourself, would Zechariah have understood it that way? Or to be more accurate to say, if I could go back and share with Zechariah what I know about the New Testament and all the things that have happened in the time since, would he say, yeah, that's a valid interpretation of what I said? Now, if he wouldn't, you've got, doesn't mean you're wrong, it just means you've got some more ground to make up before you can say that it's more than likely that my interpretation is correct. I want to suggest to you that Zechariah, in saying this, is building upon a historical model, a, a type of what he's describing, that's not only historically true, it actually happened, but this scripture is saying it's going to happen yet again. Just like Zechariah was telling them, if you go back and do the sins of your father, I'll send you into exile. There is a historical precedent for this passage. I want you to turn back with me to the book of 2 Kings, and I believe it's chapter 23. Uh, when I get there, I will give you the exact page number for those of you hunting along in that context. It's page 329. 20 years before the exile was complete, there was a king called Josiah. Josiah had the worst daddy any man could possibly have. The only thing that possibly was worse than his daddy, and I don't believe he was, but he was pretty close, was his grandfather. His daddy Ammon was so wicked, and the people were so wicked, that they killed his father. They killed Ammon, Josiah's father. His grandfather had been the son of good king Hezekiah, a man who was faithful to the Lord. And Manasseh had turned 180 degrees away from his father's way and turned back to idolatry and wickedness. So evil was he that God allowed the king of Babylon to come take him and carry him away to prison. And there in prison, Manasseh got on his knees finally and said, God, I repent of everything I've done. I'm sorry. And God in graciousness brought Manasseh back to rule upon the throne. And he did a lot to reform the nation, but he didn't get it all the way. His son, he dies, and his son Ammon takes over, and Ammon is wicked, and the people kill him. And so at the age of uh, eight, Josiah becomes king. Well, what does an eight-year-old king do? Whatever he's told for a while. Until he begins to grow up, and at the age of 16, Josiah begins to seek the Lord. Now there's a problem with that. He's got no Bible. I don't mean he doesn't have the New Testament. I don't mean he doesn't have the book of Zechariah, which hadn't been written yet. I don't mean he doesn't have the book of the Psalms. He doesn't have that. He doesn't even have Genesis. He has got zero scriptures to build upon, but he's decided at age 16, I'm going to seek the Lord. And so he reasons out. I believe he thinks through things and decides that, well, the only way I can seek the Lord is we've got to repair the temple of God and go back to worshiping the Lord there in that place. We know that my ancestor David met God in that place. And maybe I, if we we'll get that temple fixed, then I can meet God there. And so he gives the money in order to begin repairing, to pay the carpenters, to pay the people that are going to just sweep the place out and clean it up and where all the chairs have been jumbled up and turned over and clean all of that out and search through all the rubble. Uh, some of you were around when the church flooded. And you remember what a mess it was. Well, multiply that by about 20 or 30 years of just sitting there. You know, you're going to have to pay somebody to come do that because it's a mess. And in the process of cleaning out the temple, when Josiah is about uh, 26 years of age or so, his foreman, his prime minister, comes to him and he says, here's the accounting of the money. Oh, and by the way, we have found a copy of the law of Moses in the temple. And he begins to read to the king the law. And the more he reads, the more troubled the king becomes. Until finally he rips his royal garments to show his grief. Because he recognizes we have done so much against the God in whom we're in agreement with. And whom we're in covenant with. That he must certainly come and punish us. And he's so bereaved over this. And so concerned about this 
that he says, go to the prophetess Hulda and ask her, what does God say is going to happen to us? And so he sends the Shaphan, his prime minister, sends people to this prophetess and say, we need a word from the Lord. What does God say is going to happen? And she says, because you have violated the terms of the agreement, you have been going after other gods, because you have become such and such people, and because of what your grandfather Manasseh did, it is inevitable God is going to destroy this place and this nation. He's going to carry you off into exile just as he said he would in the book of Deuteronomy. And you look at the end of the De book of Deuteronomy, and you'll find God said, here's exactly what's going to happen if you disobey me. But, she says, tell the one who sent you, King Josiah, this young man, I won't do it in his days, because he has turned to seek me. So King Josiah, armored with that, goes throughout the land and cleans up the land. He gets rid of the idols. He burns them. He even takes the bones of the prophets, and burns them, except for one. There was one prophet who said, there's, there's coming a man, told Jeroboam this, he said, there's coming a man named Josiah, and he will tear down what you've done. We find that, they said, whose bones are they? He said, this is a prophet that foretold everything you're doing of cleaning up all of this and destroying all this idolatry. He said, leave his bones alone. He's a man of God. He goes back and he cleans up Judea. He'd done that up in Israel. He comes back to Judea and cleans up. And he says, let's worship the Lord through the Passover. And so they, they, they observe a Passover such as never, the scripture says, never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. Now think about that. There had never been one like him. You know what that means? Not even King David was as zealous for God as Josiah. Not even Solomon with all of his wisdom had the zeal for God that this young man, King Josiah, had. And he goes on to say, and there has never been a king like him since. Let me pause just a moment. I sure wish God could say that of me and say that of you. What an epitaph to be written about you. There was never anybody in his family before or since that sought the Lord like he did. It really was. Remember, this guy started at age 16 to seek the Lord whom he had knew almost nothing about. And this is what God's inspired testimony about him was. He cleans up the land. There's no idolatry. Everybody's worshiping the Lord. They don't have an option. And then at the age of 39, this great king is killed in battle. So lamentable is this, that even the prophet Jeremiah writes a lament about it. Do you remember when we were studying through Zechariah and it talked about all the lamenting? We've been doing this for 70 some years. We've been lamenting for years and years and years about this. They started the day King Josiah died. Because they knew once he dies, it's coming. Now, was there something wrong with King Josiah that God killed him? Not a thing. You see now why I go to Zechariah 13 and I say, you know, there may not be anything wrong at all with the shepherd. The problem is the sheep. Within three years of the death of King Josiah, Daniel and his friends are carried away into captivity. Less than a decade later, Ezekiel, the prophet, and his group are carried away into exile. And 23 years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes, he destroys Jerusalem, he destroys the temple, absolutely wipes it out, not one stone left upon another, breaks down the walls of the city, and carries anybody that has any skills whatsoever to Babylon. The only people he leaves behind are the people that couldn't plow a straight furrow if you marked it out and they just had to follow the line. That's the kind of people he leaves. People that don't know how to do it, he says, I'll leave those people. But anybody that has any capacity to help rebuild this society, I'm going to take them away into exile. That had just happened less than 70 years before Zechariah started preaching. The problem wasn't the shepherd. The problem was the sheep, the people of Israel. What's the remedy? Well, if God was just, and God is just, he would certainly be justified in saying, you've gone into exile, into exile you'll stay, you'll die in exile, and you'll never return to the land. But he says in verse 8, two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord. Two-thirds are going to be cut off and die, the Lord says. What a tragedy, but it's just. Let's say a gangster pulls out a gun and shoots another gangster, maybe over a drug deal. Well, it's a tragedy, but would you say it's just? You see, that was the end result of that kind of lifestyle. I've got a gun. I'm going to defend mine. 
he's a rival, I'm going to kill him. Well, that's a just sentence. God has worked a justice there, particularly if they both shoot each other in the shootout. And both of them die, well, we say, well, there's absolute justice. Tragic, but not unjust. Let's say a son or daughter deceives their parents and starts hanging out with the wrong crowd. Maybe they get with the wrong crowd and they've got a car and they're driving the car. And they're taking the two friends and they stop at this convenience store, a little store, and the friends go in and they rob the clerk and they shoot him. And they flee and they say, flee, flee, hurry, we've got to go, got to go. We, we've, we've done something and it flees off. And it turns out they've killed the man. He dies. And the friend winds up in jail because he drove the getaway car and also because the two friends lied about him and said he's the one that did it. Well, is that just? Well, there's a certain injustice to it, but my friend said I, I was, it was just what happened to me that I was put on death row because I shouldn't have been where I was. You can read about it in the life of Harold Morris. He'll talk about that. There is a penalty that comes when we're doing the wrong thing, when we're being deceptive, when we're running with the wrong crowd. There is a justice of God that's going to come upon us because of the evil that we're doing, the sin that we're doing. God would be perfectly just in doing that with any of us. I've seen accidents that I've been in, except mine wasn't an accident. But I've seen people flip cars doing things I did, and my car didn't flip. I saw a lady one time, she just hit, hit the curb, and her whole car flipped over on the roof. I can tell you, I've driven along and I've hit the curb, but my car didn't flip. There is a mercy that God has for his people in spite of the fact that we deserve justice. And that's the next part of that verse. Verse 8 says, Two-thirds of the people of the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord. If it stopped there, God would certainly be saying, I'm going to carry out justice. But notice what he says. But one-third will be left in the land. Why does he preserve the one-third? Not because they don't deserve the punishment, but because God has decided to be gracious and to show that he is a God not only of justice, but a God of grace to that remnant there in the land. It is God's grace which will purify the remnant. Now there's some people would say, well, getting rid of the two-thirds, getting rid of the bad people, that's what purified the land. You get the, bad, the really bad people out, and that'll take care of it. No, they all had a heart of idolatry. They all were seeking after fortune tellers. They all were trying to get their dreams interpreted by somebody who said, I can interpret your dream for it. If you've got the money, I've got the interpretation. They all were consulting anything else they could consult except God. But God said, I'm going to be gracious to that remnant, but they have to be purified. How's he going to purify them? Look at verse 9. I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. God says, I'm going to take you through terrible trouble, so terrible that you can call it like fire. Just like the fire purifies silver and purifies gold, what I'm going to bring through you through, I'm going to take you through, is going to purify my people when you refine silver and gold, which I've not done. I'm telling you what I've read, what I've said. But when you refine silver, one of the things that has to be done is everything that's called dross, you heat it to where that dross either boils off or you can skim that off. And when you skim that off, then as you keep going, you keep going. Pretty soon there's nothing left but pure silver, 99, 44, 100% pure silver, or gold. You get rid of all the junk that isn't gold, and what you're left with, you know, all the things, the, you know, coal and all the other things that might be around it, you get all of that junk off, and what you're left with is something that's pure. That's the analogy he's using here. That the refinement of fire, I'm going to take you through difficulties, and next week, I don't want to do it, but next week I'm going to have to tell you what those difficulties are in chapter 14. But it's horrible what these folks are going to go through. It's as bad as 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city. It's coming again, he says, because it's going to take that to purify you. And that's just the beginning of the purification. I'm going to put you through the fire. I'm going to bring you through suffering and hardship and disappointment and agony. But in the end, I'm going to bring you to the place where you call upon me, and even where I will say, he says here in verse 9, they will call on my name. God says, I'll answer them. Now, if that's not grace, I don't know what is. You don't deserve to have God answer your prayer. I know I don't, and I'm pretty sure I'm about as good as anybody in here. 
I don't really have a demand upon God. Well, God, I've done this and this and this. I've been right and right and right and right. God, you have to answer my prayer. No, no, no. The very fact that God is willing to answer our prayer shows how gracious God is. But did you notice what he said? When they call on me, I will answer. It's almost automatic. All I was waiting on is for you to call on me. You've been to the fortune teller. You've been over here for advice. You've been over there for advice. You've been up on this high hill offering up incense. You've been doing everything else except calling upon me. You didn't call on my name. You didn't pray to me and say, God, you're the only one. There's a gospel song that says, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. Maybe you've got troubles in your life. One of the good things about trouble is it makes you call on the Lord. I mean, you try all the other nonsense, but sooner or later you get down to where, God, I need you. And God says to that remnant, I'm here, I'll answer you. If you call on me, in fact, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation works that way. It's not I've gone through all, I've been to church, I've given money, I've been to the Lord's table, I've been baptized, I've done all this, I've gone, gone to school, I've done these things, I've taught Sunday school, I've worked in Awana. Surely in all of this, everything around here, no, how do you get saved? You get saved by calling on the Lord. You bring nothing except a sinner to the Lord. And God says, when you call on me, I'll answer you. And look what he says. Look what he says in verse 9. I will say, these are my people. God says it first. You're mine. Just like the shepherd was mine, my partner, you're my people. And then we respond, the Lord is our God. We've got no other. The Lord is our God. If there is ever an apt description of the grace of God, it's in verse 9. This is how God works. God takes us in our sin, our failure, our lack of being what we ought to be, and God says, I'll bring you through the fire, but I'm going to get you to the point where you call on me. And when you do that, I will answer, and I will say, you're my people. And the cry comes from our heart. The response is, Abba, Father, the Lord is our God. What do we do with this? Well, you know, Jesus claimed this passage as his own. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, he identified himself with this product, uh, this prophecy. <clears throat> Jesus says, I'm the shepherd and you're the sheep. Turn to page 825 in your pew Bible. You need to see this. There's certain places in your Bible you just really need to know about. Jesus and the disciples have just left the upper room. They've just observed what we call the Lord's table that Passover meal, where he infused it with the meaning. And then he says in verse 31, On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. You ever heard that before? We just read that, didn't we? Let me reinforce my interpretation. Was there something wrong with the shepherd? Not a thing. The problem was, if I don't strike the shepherd, I can't save the sheep. What did it take? For God to save you, he had to strike the shepherd. What happened to the sheep? They all scattered. Look down at verse 33. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. There's Peter. Jesus said, before the night's out, you'll have denied me at least three times. But go back to what he said in verse 31. God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But look at verse 32. But after I have been raised from the dead, you see that changed everything. Josiah was never raised from the dead. But he said, after I'm raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, and I will meet you there. That's relationship. I'm your God. You're my people. I'll meet you there. The gospel message is that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. And we know that's true because God raised him from the dead on the third day. God himself has testified, this is no Josiah. This is Jesus, the Savior. Here's the one by whom I'm going to judge the whole world. Have you put your trust in him? The disciples scattered, but within three days, God had brought them back. It didn't take 70 years. didn't take 2,000 years. He brought them back to himself. He had recharged them. And uh, he even tells Peter in John chapter 21, three things I want you to do. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to tend my sheep, and I want you to feed my sheep. Well, that's what he told Peter to do. I think it's a good instructive for us. We need to be caring about making sure that our children get the Word of God. That's feeding them. We need to make certain parents and grandparents 
that our children and grandchildren are getting the Word of God, that they're learning what the Scriptures say. They were also leading them to discover the right interpretation, trying to teach them the skills, but also giving them the correct interpretation, but making certain they are getting the food that they need, which is the Word of God. There should never be a child like Josiah who wanted to seek the Lord but didn't have the Scriptures, didn't have any idea how to go about it. And there was nobody else that could tell him. Every child needs to have a copy of the Word of God. They need to be taught the Word of God. They need to learn the things of God. That's mom and dad's job. You need to be teaching your children the Word of God, feeding the lamb. One of the roles that some of us have is to tend the sheep and to feed the sheep. Well, sheep, that's adults. Lambs, those are little ones. Sheep, that's you folks that are mostly in here. Most of you are either sheep or you're on the way to being some of your little lambs, but most of you are sheep. And you've got little lambs, and you need to be teaching them the Word of God. We're going to bless God today. If we're going to turn our family, our generations, over to the Lord, we've got to teach them the Word of God. There is no other possibility. Reading theology is great, but it's not as good as reading the Bible. Learning theology is great, but it's not as good as reading the Bible. We need to go back to the Scriptures. If you don't know the Scriptures, let me suggest how you start with the Scriptures. Take a book of the Bible and spend the next month reading it. Now don't start with Zechariah, unless you've been here through the whole study. The whole point of this study has been so you could read Zechariah and make sense of it yourself. You would know the background, the history, and so forth that was going on, so you'd have the framework you needed to understand what he was saying and how to apply that. Combine that with the knowledge from the New Testament, you'd know where it goes. <clears throat> start with something a little simpler. And I hesitate to suggest because there's some really tough books in the New Testament, but they're absolutely worthwhile knowing. But don't start with Romans. I hesitate to tell you to start with Ephesians, but you really ought to, because Ephesians is a little Roman. So if you get through Ephesians, then you can go to Romans, or start with the Gospel of John. Start with something, but start reading that one book every day. If I'm going to master one book of the Bible, I'm going to spend every day reading that book. That's why I suggest you don't go through Romans. It's 16 long chapters. It'd be like suggesting you start with Isaiah with the 66 chapters. I want you to go through it more than once. Read it several times. Uh, if you pick one of these little books like Ephesians, there's six chapters, you should be able to finish it every two days and just read it and read it and read it and read it looking for what does it say? What does it say? And I would suggest you also might have a pad and paper and write down the questions. What in the world does he mean by redemption? You could put redemption, question mark. You could put election, question mark. You could put transgressions, question mark. And you're looking for, what does he mean by these things? And get to so you know at least one book of Scripture. You know that one. I've read it. Spend a whole month on that one book. You know what you do the second month? Pick another book. If you'll do that, in about four and a half years, you will have mastered the Bible enough so that you can read it and interpret it. It'll take you about that long to have some confidence. But that simple plan is the way to do it. If you will do that, I guarantee you in four and a half years from now, you'll have gone through every book of the Bible. You will have questions answered that you wrote down. Those will be answered. Now, I don't want to fool you. You're going to have an entirely new set of questions. <laughs> but you will know the answers to those initial questions. And you will have gained in skill by working with the Word of God. And depending upon the Spirit of God, you will have gained the skills that you need to read any passage of Scripture and begin to give a reasonable interpretation of what that author was saying and in turn what God is saying to us. Don't go to it looking for what you can get out of it. Lord, show me what this means to me. That, that's later on. That's like three weeks into reading that book. You might start asking that question. Well, this is what he was saying to them. Now, what does it mean to me? How does it apply to me? What am I supposed to do about it? Good thing to ask, but you need to train yourself. But if you will do that, God will enable you to master his word and teach it to others. One more thing I want to suggest to you before we close. Beware false prophets. Beware the false prophets. There are false prophets that were the problem in that day. Read back in just the first part of chapter 13. They were even, there's come a day when they're going to even be ashamed to claim to be a prophet. But they're not ashamed today. There's a lot of people out there that are false prophets. There's some people that are just flat out wrong. But there's some people that know they're wrong and it doesn't matter because they're making a good living at it. This is the word of God. I'll take this over anybody's dream, anybody's vision, anybody's pulling a verse out of here and say this is what, you know, 
this is the whole counsel of God. Study the whole counsel of God and say, you might be right, but you may not be right. You're not the authority. God's word is my authority. You do that honestly before the Lord, and God will lead and guide you. Now listen, listen to me very carefully. He'll guide you, he'll guide your children, and he'll guide your grandchildren in the walking with him, if you'll do that. I represent the third generation in my family. My children represent the fourth generation. I'm praying for the fifth generation that they will know the Lord. But I'm telling you, my grandparents started seeking the Lord and turned to follow the Lord, and it's made a difference through the generations. If you'll do this, God will change our country. But even if he doesn't change the country, he'll change your family. And he'll fit your family, your children, your grandchildren for eternity. And that's where we're headed. Let's bow together in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, you are indeed our God. You are the Lord of our life. You have the right to tell us what to do and when to do it and how to live and how not to live. And we acknowledge that simply and solely because you've been gracious to us. What amazing grace that truly was. Lord, send us forth from this place to seek your face. Whether we're young or old, maybe an 8-year-old child, maybe a 16-year-old child, maybe somebody 21 years old or 26 years old or somebody much older than that. But Father, send us forth to seek your face that we might know you. And Lord, we know that if, you, if we truly see that you will be found of us, that's your promise. Lord, give us faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.